So it's, it's kind of interesting here being a you know bachelor degree guy and being able to help you guys help you all with your degree pursuits. It's very I'm flattered and I appreciate the opportunity. So a lot of um, studies these days, so I imagine are, a lot of people focus on um, LTE, and there's a lot of work going on on spectrum sharing. So for my talk today, I'm going to you know go over a program that was, that was recently initiated about a year and a half ago called the Spectrum Sharing Test and Demonstration Program. So, um, and uh, so let's go. I'm going to go right on. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So why does this program exist? So Back in um, November of 2014, and in, uh, there was the AWS3 auction. So there was a there was a move. There's a move by the by the president of the United States to open up 500 megahertz of spectrum to expand the use of LTE. You know, we're all using data significantly these days. So there's more and more and more. So there's need for more spectrum. It's getting more crowded. So that auction generated it was over and, and the focus of that auction was on 25 megahertz of bandwidth from 1755 to 1780 megahertz for UE up for, for LTE uplinks. That 25 megahertz of spectrum in that auction which went from November of 2014 and it ended on January 30th of 2015 generated 42 billion dollars of revenue for the US, for the United States. From that chunk of money there was, an, there was an emphasis on, there's a lot of DOD, there's a, quite a number of DOD systems in that small chunk of bandwidth. And so over time, they have to, those systems have to leave in order for LTE systems to be deployed and for those LTE systems of the carriers that bought the licenses with, that, with their investment to in order to generate income from that investment. So there's a, so what happened is the, um, the, DO, the, the, the NTIA and the FCC set up a committee called CSMAC, which is the Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee. What that committee did was establish criteria by which the interference from LTE to DOD systems that existed in that 25 megahertz of spectrum could be defined so that protection criteria could be established. And so you can kind of see it if you look, you know, right here in this 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 graphic right here. You kind of see it's, a, it's a, just a picture of you've got LTE systems deployed over you know many different you know environments, and you've got a number of DoD assets, and they're all being if they were all using the same frequencies at the same time, there's going to be some there's going to be some interference for that, okay? And so what you what you want to do is you want to make sure that let's understand what, under what conditions they could coexist or under what conditions can we allow the, the LTE systems to be deployed without interfering with those systems. Our customer for this program is the Department of Defense and specifically the Defense Spectrum Organization or the DSO. That's who we re re represent. So our job for the program is to protect DOD assets so that the American warfighter can train as he fights and, and execute his mission as already designed. Okay? Now, so through that process of the CSMAC established that criteria, they also established a timeline by which the, the, air, the, the geographic areas where those systems exist can, 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 lock, can or, in an organized manner move out of that spectrum but, and re-implement those systems at other spectrum without impacting the training and the requirements of the DOD. Okay, and that exists, that the, we call that the transition timeline. And the different systems are leaving some in 12 months, some in 24, some in 66 months, some in 10 years. But in, in it, there's large areas of the United States, um, of CONUS, the continental United States, that are affected by that, okay? So in order for the LTE carriers who have made this giant investment to be able to take advantage of that, they have to be able to deploy, and there has to be a way to measure what their, what their laydowns are for their networks and see where is it going to in interfere with these systems as they leave and where it's not. And so that process gives them a, yes, you can put this cell sector down, and no, you can't do that one. Okay? Now, the purpose of this program was to try and expedite Facilitate, you see the two objectives here, facilitate, facilitate expedited and expanded entry of these commercial systems in those bands, and, and we want to do that as fast, and so the key word there is expedited and expanded. So the timelines are established, but we want to be able to 
provide the opportunity for those carriers who made this large investment to deploy in those areas earlier, because that can generate more revenue, more jobs, et cetera, okay, help the U.S. economy. Now, so in order to do that, the things that we need to do is we need to understand the interactions that can go on between these systems so that we can support and allow that to happen. Try to shrink those coordination zones that are defined by CSMAC to as much as possible or, and, and you know, so that there can be more deployments faster. So in order to do that, there's the second objective here, which is identify, assess, test, demonstrate, and operationalize those the coexistence assessments. So understand interference. What are the interference mitigation techniques that can be applied? And you want to use stuff that the LTE um, system providers can deploy, leveraging what they, how they, how they already operate. You, know, you want to get into real exotic implementations, okay? So, in order to do that, at the bottom of the page here, you can see there's many different aspects of the program that the program are focusing on. Improved propagation modeling, improved clutter modeling, uh, the application of, of interference mitigation techniques that exist within LTE systems now and in the near future. Understand the interference that LTE provides to the DOD as well as interference to those LTE systems from DOD systems that may exist, that exist in that same area. And all of this, one of the other things that's going on is the DOD is doing a lot of work to try to use LTE as supplemental communications to support mission execution. I mean, these, were, these, hand, these are a whole lot cheaper than tactical software defined radios that they use now. So if they can implement communications where where the warfighter is using a cellular handset, they can deploy and have more robust communications at a lot lower price. So that's another way. So there's another thing that we're, by us learning all the, about this and applying that and giving it to the DOD, they can go figure out how do I use that system in, 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 in areas where, I mean, if you think about like on a ship or something, how many different types of wireless communication are going on and radars and and uh, you know for you know for for sensing, uh, there's uh, electronic warfare going on. I mean, there's a lot of interference environment. The, the the electromagnetic environment on ships is very diverse. And so, by learning more about this kind of stuff and applying it there, you can see how it can do that without interfering with other systems or those inner systems not allowing uh, a an LTE deployed systems in a DoD application to be to be actually fruitful for their what they need. Okay, so. Along with that, we have to go do predictions on the LTE emissions. We have to and then understand receiver degradation for the DOD receivers and make sure we have a real good understanding of the risk assessment so we can say, okay, how do we want to do, how much benefit are we going to get or how much protection is necessary? Okay, kind of gone over some of this already. So in terms of a primary context, so we're trying to understand and develop an increasingly more realistic assessment of the impacts to DOD operations from LTE and from DOD operations to LTE. So it kind of goes both ways, and that makes sense, right? I mean, if, I'm, if I have a, and I'm going to give you a context here in a second, but if you, if you look at the, the top, you know, going from left to right across the type, you see that you've got LTE systems, there's a, and there's a propagation environment, and then there's the DOD receivers. And you can kind of, I'm not going to get into the details of the parameters that are listed there, because you guys are studying that kind of stuff. You understand that stuff at a, at a, at a reasonable level. But that's the, that's, the, that's the electromagnetic environment that we're talking about. And it goes in both directions. You can see the top one is going from LTE to DOD receivers, and the bottom one is from DOD emissions to the same or similar propagation environment to the LTE system. And I'm going to give you some context of why that matters. So for the top one, I'm going to get, I'm a fighter pilot and I'm doing training down in Eglin Air Force Base in northwestern Florida. And I'm flying what's called, in, in what's called the Air Com, the ACTS, which is the Air Combat Training System. It's a pod mounted on the plane and it's got, uh, you know, it, it, it sends signals and information of the, of the airplane's attitude when it's firing. With these, they use that during, you know, all the training that they do, whether it's attack or fighter to fighter, whatever. So the guy's flying at 30,000 feet off in the range over the Gulf of Mexico. The number of handsets that are visible to him in the electro electromagnetic environment extend from Beaumont, Texas, all the way to Marco Island, Florida. 
So how many different networks do you think that is? And, that, and how many handsets at any moment in time do you think that that, asset, that DOD asset can see in terms of generating a conglomerated effect of, of, radio, of radio emission interference? thousands of these at any moment. So that, you can get a good context of why this problem exists. Now that's an example of an air to ground link that's thing uh, from, of a DOD system. There are many type, there are many systems, that, DOD systems that exist in that 25 megahertz bandwidth. Some are ground to ground. There's, um, there's robotics, communicate, you know, uh, control communications. There's video, there's the ACTS, there's, um, there's uh, AMT, which is a, a uh, tel telemetry link, when, like when they, they, they launched the DOD rod launches missile launches, they attack telemetry attach telemetry systems to them, and those telemetry systems sends a lot of data back to large gr you know, ground receivers with large antennas so that they can get a lot of data about how did that test go, did, it do, did that at missile do what I thought it was going to do. And those things take up a lot of space. They cover a lot of area as well. So those are the kind of systems that are being interfered with. And then on the other way back, and you can see how a large number of these can interfere with the DOD system, and that is the band that we care about most. It's an uplink band. Now on the downlink side, it's not quite the same thing, but if a DOD asset, and there is one that does this, it's called a SATOPS, a satellite operations, and these are large ground stations that are in specific locations around the country that are controlling DOD satellites in, 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 in uh, both low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, or geosynchronous orbit. And, so they're, and, they're, con and they're constantly moving around and, and looking at different, uh, the same system controls many different satellite systems. And, that, and there are emissions from that that actually can interfere with the handsets as well. So what's going to happen? A handset is going to detect interference it's going to not receive stuff. It's going to send, well, I didn't get this. It's going to send hearts back to the E node B, and the E node B is going to have to, you know, adapt to that and send, and, and, and so the data rate's lower. So it goes both ways, okay? And that's the point. And those are a couple of good examples. Okay, so a portion of the program is focused on LTE characterization, and that's the, the part that uh, Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation is participating in. And the, and the activities within the SSTND program. So, this slide is showing, you know, kind of the, a, a a high level view contextual of what we are doing. So, the first, the, as you look at the top of the page here, it talks about finding an outcome, findings and outcomes. Okay, so we're doing work, and I'm going to describe that in a second. But it's like, why are we doing that? So, we're going to deliver what we learn to the the models that are being used to allow the carriers to be to do their laydowns earlier. So we're, we're providing statistics and data so that they can, to those models that are, that are being used to analyze the, um, the laydowns. The carriers come in and they submit a laydown for a network, and it could be a thousand, a thousand cell sites. Well, those cell sites and their locations matter relative to the DOD systems and the coordination zones that are nearby. So you have to be able to do a really good an analysis of that electromagnetic environment in order to say, yes, you can put these cell sites down and no, you can't do these. So we want to make sure we maximize the yeses, minimize the noes while protecting the DOD assets. And so, so that's where the findings and outcomes, that's, 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 our, that's, our, that's our delivery of our, of, our, of our data and what we're going to be doing. So in order to do that, we have to do a lot of analytics and that includes looking at LTE specifications, doing analysis, of some specific LTE characteristics that matter relative to uplink emissions. And also we have to model those. So we have a team that's modeling um, and trying to predict how an LTE system will react in the environments that I kind of described earlier, okay? So, and along with that, models are only as good as what you put into them. And, so you, and you also want to verify that those models are representing reality. So to support that, there's a whole test and measurement activity going on, and that's what's discussed on, that's what's kind of shown on the bottom of the slide. Now from left to right, you can see there's a, it says it starts at bench test, then lab and limited field testing, and field measurement. So the complexity of the testing is increasing from left to right, right? It's, it's, e it's less cost to do the bench test, it's more expensive to do field measurements, but you get different value from each. 
And so we're, we're doing a little bit of all of these things to help inform the modeling. And the modeling team is actually saying, well, these are the parameters that I need to know about so that I can describe that uplink and mission environment in my models adequately to, for the needs of, the, of, the, of um, the, uh, the program and to deliver the findings to the modeling that I talked that I, the reporting that I talked about, okay? So, I mean, you guys can jump in with questions anytime. I tried to design this presentation to only go 40 minutes, so there'll be time at the end as well, your choice, so, okay? All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the modeling and simulation activities, all right? And I'm going to give this a pretty broad brush. And the reason for that is to, and my, my focus of this presentation with more detail is on the mod, is on the testing and measurement, but why am I doing that test and measurement? You got to have a little bit of context here, and that's why I'm going to present something about modeling, okay? All right. So the roadmap for the, this is a, a, a high level view of the roadmap of our, of our modeling team's work to do, to characterize LTE systems. Now I'm going to just briefly focus on the capability attributes, which is the, the progression that's described at the, on the top of the slide. Where we are right now is we're in the early, in the early to middle stages of phase one, which means we're doing pretty good relative to our target timeline. The guys that are doing the modeling work have developed an ensemble model, and they've started from the simplified LTE interference model. Now, I mentioned CSMAC earlier, and I mentioned what the, they did to help define the protection criteria for the DOD systems. That is, we had to, the first thing we had to do was let's duplicate what those guys did, okay? So that was the first thing. And once we got that duplicated, then it's like, okay, now let's go towards you know, a more refined model and that's where we are right now in the, in the phase one. And eventually we'll, we'll continue to add complexity to the model and more depth to it so that it, and, and, and so it can be applicable to more and more different um, sector morphologies and network morphologies for how you know, the carriers deploy their networks in, real, in, in the real world. And you can see that also this progression eventually as 5G starts to become better defined, at this point in this specific band, and in other bands, it's not really sure how they're going to deploy 5G yet, how they use some of these lower frequencies, and if they're going to focus on higher frequencies for the real data transmissions. There's a lot of discussion about that going on right now. It's not defined, but whatever we learn here could be applied in other bands. There's no reason it couldn't be. And so if this is a good model eventually for how you would try to go about doing combination of spectrum sharing and spectrum avoidance it could be applied in other places so you don't have to you know reinvent the wheel you can go use what we've learned from this program and apply it again saves all of us taxpayers money right so anyway that's the context of it all right now so let's talk about the approach and it's the relationship of this of the modeling approach to testing and measurement okay so first of all I'm going to go just briefly through, I'm not going to concentrate so much on the bullets. I'm going to focus more on the, um, the the picture. So, so the first thing we've done is like, okay, we need to kind of, we kind of we've developed a model that's duplicated the CSMAC, um, uh, uh, the CSAC models and the characteristics. And it's like, okay, now let's make sure we understand which parameters in an LTE network and out and there and the algorithms that affect those. Which of the ones have the most significant impact on uplink UE emissions? A UE is a handset or, you know, it's just called a user equipment. I mean, you guys are, I imagine you guys are familiar with that terminology. If you're not, please you know, let me know. So, anyway, so the first thing is like, okay, which parameters are going to affect the uplink emissions across a channel on a, the most? Right, that's the first thing. And so we're going to do sensitivity studies, and we're going to determine which parameters are the highest impact. And so that's what this, this, if you look at this right here, we identify the key parameters and apply the algorithms for them and perform those sensitivity studies. And by doing that, we generate that list of parameters that matter the most. And what that does is there's a feedback, you know, to and, to and from the measurement activities like, okay, so let's, what are those, what are those things? And so those are the, those are the parameters we want to be able to go and collect out in the field right or in, in the lab or wherever you do your testing so that you can inform get data and st characteristics about those specific parameters and feed them back to the modeling team and what that allows them to do is then say okay now I want to define some operational scenarios okay and we're going to talk a little bit about those in a minute 
And once I get those, then I can go and do detailed simulations about specific, under specific environments that are applied to that network in the model, including variations of traffic load, like Lane Stadium on a Saturday during a football game. I don't know if you guys ever even tried to send a text during that. It's impossible. So there's, you know, what happens then versus a rural, you know, and there's different times of day. Let's say you go downtown D.C. during the day versus at 11 o'clock at night, you know, so there's, there, there's some examples. You're going to see significant variation in the use load on, this, on the sectors and stuff between time and day. So we do detailed simulations of that so that we can understand what the, what's happening relative to the interactions between the UEs and the E node B and what are the result and emissions that the, that the UEs provide in that channel, okay? So as a result of all that, we've kind of come up with some plans. Okay, so what do we want to do relative to field measurements and so that can it help inform those models and so the models can be compared to that and say, okay, my model is making sense or it's not making sense and we need to do some things to make it better, okay? So here's some of the characteristics. If you look at this list right here under field testing, you know, there's E, e node B to UE interactions. I talked about that. Get the parameters different cell morphologies, and I'm going to talk about that on the very next slide because CSMAC started with a very basic set, urban, suburban, combined, and rural. So there's two different morphologies. Well, that's oversimplistic, and so we'll get into that a little bit in a second. Um, power control parameters, that's a, a very big focus. And inferring schedule algorithms, and I'll get to that in a minute because when you're out measuring an LTE system in the field, you have no control over what the E-Node-B settings are. And the E-Node-B settings, we've been talking with a lot of, of uh, equipment providers like Nokia Networks and Ericsson, and uh, there's some companies that actually are spin-offs of Ericsson that provide the DOD with you know, small E-Node-Bs called, it's in the company by the name of Oseus, if any have heard of them, but they use Ericsson equipment. But the number of controls that are available on those E-Node-Bs is, is very large. There's a lot of customization that can be done by the equipment providers and by the, uh, the carriers to optimize their networks. And so the one thing that's not covered in the 3GPP specifications is the scheduler. The scheduler is left up to the carrier and the equipment providers to do so they can optimize the coverage and the, and the, um, and the capacity of their network and to generate revenue. To optimize, and, that, and that's what they think about. Okay, so so there, those are things that we can't see that, so we have to infer it from the measurements, and that's what we hope to be able to do. All right. Okay. Froze. There it goes. Okay. So where are the, now? Right now. Whoops. Sorry. Why is it doing that? There we go. Okay. So right now. Where the, the guys in the modeling team, what they're at, where they're at is they're in the middle of phase one, and this is some output, one of the outputs. And what you're seeing here is this plot right here is a cumulative distribution function of the UE transmit power from, some, from several different simulations run on the model that I was just describing. Now, I mentioned CSMAC earlier, and they're, and they're very simplistic. They, have an, they had an urban morphology, which was combined urban, suburban, and rural. Those are the, you see the CDFs of those are, are covered by the, the blue squares and then the, um, the orangish yellow um, diamonds. Okay, so that's where they ended up. Now, as the, the different numbers that you see in the upper right here, those are different inner sight distances, which is establishes a distance from, ENA, from, from the antenna, cell site antenna to cell site antenna for different sectors, okay? And, so those, and that's in meters. So when you see, so like 200, you can see down here, you can relate those down in the table down below. So what, what the guys on the team that did the modeling did is that, well, we really need to have, we need to be able to have a little more granularity into the morphology of the sectors that are being deployed because that's really, that's more realistic, and, and, and I gotta get, be able to see into this more. So, like, there's, so there's, you know, micro, dense, urban, urban, suburban, and rural. So they broke it down into five. And those are defined by those ISD distances that you see in the second column there. And those are the columns that align with the, with the five lines that are the, that show the CDF of the transmit power. And so it's, it, it's, it, it kind of makes intuitive sense that a rural, uh, you know, one that's like 7,000, 
uh, meters, which is you know seven kilometers of distance between, is going to have require UE transmit powers to be higher than than the other ones that are there, and you can see that. Now, and the interesting part is that relative to the CSMAC um, rural, the, the rural, the the two rural lines in our model are actually to the right of that, which means that the UE emissions are on a, on for the most part higher. Well, in the coordination process that we just talked about. That's actually not a good thing, right? See, the DO, there could be more DOD assets. The coordination zones may actually have to get larger for certain areas where hopefully there's less DOD systems because it's in the rural environment. And then when you get into the cities where we where the where you can see that the, where the uh, urban CSMAC curve was before, there's a mix, and so you're going to have some that are going to be less and some that are going to be more. So again, we'll be able to apply these curves into the coordination process for allowing the carriers to deploy with more accurate assessments so that the DOD assets are protected, but we can still allow those LTE carriers to deploy earlier. Okay, that makes sense. This is where they're, they're at in their model. And we're going to continue to evolve this model more and more to make sure that we're not overly conservative, but we're, but we're not to adding risk to that interference scenario as well. Okay? All right, so now, this is the part that's near and dear to my, part, my heart because this is the work I'm doing. Now, network field measure. We have to be, like I said, we want to be able to go get data so that we can inform those models. I'm doing pretty good on time. I've got 20 minutes. Okay. So what are the objectives of that, of that measurement, of that uh, measurement activity? So the first off is that we're going to go out, we want to go out and collect some empirical data to be able to refine those LTE models that I discussed already. And the way to do that is, is going to be limited by what kind of test equipment is available in industry, right? Now, most of that equipment, those equipment providers, are supporting the carriers. The carriers are focused on the downlink. What we care about is the uplink. And so that provides a little bit of a problem, right? I mean, it's like most of the equipment that you can see, and we did quite a bit of assessments of various equipment so that we could make sure we were designing a measurement system, then I, which I will get into some details here in a minute, that can, can provide what we need for our use case. And it, was, it wasn't real easy. And we finally can't, because most of it's focused on the downlink, like I said. Now, so, and, and what matters is how that equipment operates is going to limit how you, what you can collect. And so what happens is we found out is the one piece of equipment I want to show you right here, this is called a, a Wave Judge IntelliJudge 5000 by Sam Halletic. San Jose is a company in Hawaii. And these, so these, are guys, these are like the only guys in industry that have determined how to, how to um, collect and store in log files all the downlink and control and all the uplink information from all the UEs that it can sense in a sector at the same time. There's no other piece of equipment in industry that does that. So what it does is, so the thing is, it locks into a specific downlink sector and it synchronizes to that sector just like your handset does. And then once it synchronizes the downlink, it's, it, it, can, it, it can extract all the control information from the downlink to all the UEs that, that that sector is controlling, and it can get all the uplink control information from all the UEs within its range of detection that it can do. And that, has, and that gets into why we have certain antennas on the top, okay? So, so downlink is, the downlink are on the order of 50 to 100 watts. So you use an Omni antenna for that because you're, 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 you want to be, you have to be able to synchronize the downlink with this piece of equipment. And then for the uplink, we're using a directional cross pole antenna so we can get as much gain and, and not have as, and, and minimize the polarization loss as much as possible to extend the range of, the, of, the, of this build thing's ability to detect as many UEs as possible, okay? And it can, creates a log file of all the interactions between all those UEs and the, um, and the enode B and all the enode B control to all those UEs. And so you can get a, quite a bit of data, and I'll give you an example. We've determined based on some assessments, we did some evaluations of this equipment to make sure it was right for our use case. And we figured out that in a 15-minute collection, we're going to get about 3.6 million lines of data, which is a mix of enode B control to UEs, and then all the UEs sending its control information back on for every millisecond within that 15-minute time. 3.6 million lines of, 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 of lines of data. Okay. 
So in that 15 minute collection, so they, okay, so let me, that's, that's what this device does. Now, the reason we have the spectrum and receiver simultaneously is because, remember, the focus of this program is we have to be able to understand UE emission profiles and we have to be able to understand them for every subframe in the LT because that's what matters, right? If I'm trying to look at what is my emission profile coming from a hand, uh, uh, from a, a handset or set of handsets, it matters within every subframe, and that's a millisecond long, right? So that tells you something about you have to be able to measure the emissions and correlate it with the downlink control from the E node B to the UE within, in for that same millisecond, and that's why we have the spectrum receiver. Now this one's a fairly unique one. It's manufactured by a company called CRFS. And so this, what that thing does, if you look here, it says we want to collect, we're going to do passive over-the-air monitoring with this system. We're going to get collect and extract key network parameters from that I talked about from both the downlink and uplink control channels. And simultaneously, we want to collect time-correlated uplink RF emissions. And that's what this thing does. So both of these things have about a 10 megahertz bandwidth, okay, at, at, at any moment. And that means that the noise figure is a little bit high in order to have a decent dynamic range. And so your range is limited, and that's why I got into the antenna discussion. We're actually adding LNAs and some filtering to get rid of about uh, adjacent channel um, uh, emissions so we don't such shut down the front end. Now, so what this thing does, what this guy does is it, and all of this stuff, you see the GPS antenna feeding both. They both have GPS receivers within them. So you're going to be able to time correlate the downlink control that you capture here to the uplink emissions that'll, in an LTE system, the uplink always transmit based on the control that it received four milliseconds prior to that uplink emission, okay? So with, the, the, with GPS timestamps and universal time on both, I can correlate the emissions in this receiver that occur in that uplink from the, and I can look at the downlink control that told the UEs to do that four milliseconds before. So I can correlate, right? So now, and what that does is allow me, over time, I can trust this thing. Maybe I don't have to do so much with this in the future, but initially I want to make sure I correlate it because what matters is what, what are those emissions? What do they look like? Because I'm, if I'm doing this passive, measurement. I don't have control of the UEs I'm measuring. I have to get information from those UEs about their transmit power. I won't know what their transmit power is, right? And depending on where I place the system in the sector, you know, I could put it maybe right underneath the E node B antenna or maybe out somewhere in the middle of the sector and we're going to get into how we determine that in a minute. That's the last part here. And that's a diagnostic UE uplink loaded. Now, so in this picture, you notice this, this phone up here, and that's called a Thames phone. There's a company called Ascom. They just got recently bought by InfoVista. And they're one of several companies that, that what they do is they take very normal, the handsets that we all use, and they do an uploaded flash into the FPGAs and stuff, and they get into all the I.O. And when you, you can take that phone and you can run a script on it, which you could run like an iperf script, or you could actually script like you know I could do a UDP stream or a or a TCP stream. I could do voice if I wanted to do, and in this case, if you want to test just LTE, you've got to do Volte, otherwise it's 3G, right? So, so anyway, and Volte's not deployed everywhere yet. It's getting there. So a lot of our focus is going to be on data, and so I can run a script, and I can take this phone out into the field, and I can run that script where I can load the network. And then this thing captures um, a significant amount of information about that engagement between the, between the UE and the E node B. And so by doing that, I can go and walk around the sector and I can understand its, its size, its shape, how good it does. You know, I can maybe infer things about the scheduler from that by all this information. And so we're, we're going to use these phones to do sector surveys to determine where to place the system, and also, we can intentionally load the system so that we can see how the, how the, the, the E node B and the scheduler reacts to that. So I could, I could intentionally put a 20 megabit stream on this thing and just jam the network like crazy. And I could do five or six of them at a time if I wanted to and really load it up and see how it reacts or just do one small one or something. So there's lots of different test cases I can do. Okay, so any questions on that? I kind of understand what we're trying to do. The system is deployable. 
there's a mass that goes on and stuff, and we can probably set it up in about 15 minutes, do a measurement in fifth, for 15 to 20 measure, minutes, break it down, move on to the next location. That's kind of the plan. Because we've got a number of places we're going to deploy this, okay? It is not. The control channels are not secured. You're not getting any information off the shared channels. You're not getting any of the user information. All that's encrypted, and we have no idea what that encryption is. The CRCs and things that happen in the shared channel content, we're focusing on the control channel because that's what matters here. What we care about is how the eNode B is controlling the UE and how the UE responds and what it sends in its control channel back to the eNode B so the eNode B can help close that loop and maintain optimum communication according to that scenario, what type of error they have and what their RF environment is, right? So we're talking control channel, not shared channel content, okay? Make sense? That answer your question. Okay, great. All right, so, so now we have, we're going to do a measurement campaign. I'll try to be brief here. You guys kind of get the gist. We're going to deploy the system in different types of morphologies. And this kind of picture is kind of showing the different types of specific parameters that are on the downlink and the uplink that we care about. We could go and deploy it out near Lane Stadium, and we kind of wanted to do that. So we don't have the system yet. It's being procured right now. We're not going to be able to be ready for the UVA game. So, oh well, we'll do something different. We'll do a basketball game. We'll go to a bowl game or something. And but hopefully we'll have it ready by then. So anyway, and um, so I've kind of gone through most of the information on this on this slide right here already. I think you guys kind of understand it. Um, so I'm just going to keep moving on, unless there's a specific question. Okay, some of the specific places we're going to go and use this system. Um, we've already got some tar. We've been doing some work already. Remember when I was showing you the uh, a slide earlier that showed some of the how measurement informed the modeling and stuff and how and then the, the measurements you can do lab and bench measurements you can work in the field right so we've done a mix of that uh, one of our teammates is MITRE and they have a lab in McLean Virginia and they have some eNode and that's a picture of their eNode B in their lab right there it's just a real just a quick picture their, their lab is much more involved than that but they've done some testing there um, they also MITRE has what's called a spectrum sharing test bed in Bedford Massachusetts and they're actually doing I described a, the, a situation earlier, the, the satellite operations system, it actually provides emissions that could interfere with, with um, UE handset emissions in these bands. So they're actually simulating some sat -op signals and injecting them into a network in the lab in a coaxial environment. And they've done some testing to understand how does those signals, how do they interact, you know, at what levels do, do certain things happen? And do you, when, at what levels do you actually you know, start to compress the front end of the, of the, uh, of the, of the receiver in the, um, in the E-node B and, at, or, and or just, you know, and we're not taking it to burnout. We don't want to burn things up. E-node Bs are a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece. You don't go trash and stuff like that just for fun. So anyway, um, so they're doing that. There's another lab, and then J, J, the joint, joint staff, C4AD Enclave, that is a, there's some guys, some guys in the DOD down in Suffolk, Virginia, and they have a lab, and we're going to use, it's very small, but we can do some maximized use of LTE uplink testing in there where we can specifically load the network with various things in the coaxial environment and see how many UEs can an E-node e be control depending on its traffic at, you know, on a per millisecond basis, okay? Because a lot of you think that, yeah, there's, when you walk, when people are in a cell, there's hundreds of handsets attached to a cell at any one time, probably right around this building right now. But there's only so many of them that actually have active, you know, RRC connections going on with bears being applied. On a per millisecond basin, basis, what we've found out is that the number of UEs that are controlled on a per millisecond basis is less than 10. So they, they do things like they, 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 they time, they spread them out in time as well as in frequency in terms of their assignments so that they can manage the whole network, but on a, on a per millisecond basis, which matters in the scenarios that I've described, it's actually a fairly small number. There's reasons for that and that's why the modeling and test activities are going on, right? Okay, other things. Uh, network limited field testing. 
These pictures over here to the right, this is in Lakehurst, New Jersey. This is actually the site where the Hindenburg went down. If you guys remember that was in 1936. Um, there, there, the DOD has a LTE network and deployed in the field there, and we plan to go out and use that. We're actually going to, the picture on the right here is from my test plan. There's actually, a, we can set up three sectors. There's a, there's a tower in one location, and the distance from here, these are dirigible hangars. So they're very large. This is about two kilometers, and we can set up three sectors in there, and they use what's called a, a cell on wheels or a cow. That's what they call it. And that's a that's a there's an there's a it's a, basically it's a cell sector on wheels, and you can go set it up wherever you want to do your testing. And they've got a, a network that operates at a European band over there, and they've got an experimental FCC license. So we're going to go and do testing out in the field there. Uh, and we will be able to deploy this system, measurement system, during those tests. And we'll be able to use our TEMS phones to load the network. We're going to go up to 10 phones. We're going to vary the number of phones. We're going to vary the network load. We're going to do different. In this case, since we, the DOD owns the eNode B, we can actually set different settings in the eNode B versus test case so we can understand how the scheduler is adapting to different types of settings versus the, versus the different loads and locations of UEs, et cetera. Make, that makes sense to you all? So that's where we're going to do that. That's in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Um, and, the, and the biggest thing, I think the most informative part of using this measurement system is more this systemic identification of sectors going out into the different morphologies that were identified in the modeling activity. You know, the, there was five different categories, right? I can go to different rural locations or suburban. Now, there are other parts of the program that have been doing evaluations of different things for the purposes of propagation and clutter, and they've done a lot of work using um, the uh, land use, land cover categories that are, that are the government characterizes all of our communities by, and they've determined, you know, that there are and they, we're going to go try to do work in places where they've done work so that because one of the things we can collect from this system is the propagation is information about the propagation um, losses because the handsets calculate it all the time and they report it so we can get that data from this measurement system and we can correlate that with the studies that they've done for propagation so there's there's value for us of going to the same locations where they've done work and actually doing testing in the field so we can actually help inform them. That's kind of a secondary, you know, benefit of the of the effort. Okay, we're going to and a lot of that work's been in the D.C. area, so that's why we say you know do field me measurements of D.C. region cell sites, um, large event field measurement. I kind of talked about that already. We're gonna we're gonna once we get the system pulled together, we'll be able to go pick a few things and go do and test during you know before and before during and after events where there's going to be a lot of people at them and see what the effect is you can just outside a concert or whatever depending on what what we'll take advantage of whatever events in the local area that happen um, and then the other thing is we've been invited so this band 1755 to, to 1780 is in what's called band 66 that's a new designation by the 3gpp for and that is a portion of it it used to overlap into band four, but now they've made another new designation, and that's band 66. Well, we've been invited by some of the carriers who are getting ready to do some small deployments in a couple parts of the country because this this uh, auction happened what two years ago, right? It'll be two years ago in February. The the Enode B manufacturers are just starting to build Enode Bs for these for this band. They didn't have them before. So now that they have them, they, they, the, the carriers are going to do testing out in the field, and so they've invited us to go do measurements in their, in the, during their field monitoring, their trials, okay? So we're going to go into there's the two locations right now are Phoenix and California, I think, is in the Napa Valley area. Pretty nice place. So. Okay, so talked about all this data. What are you going to do with it? I mean, it's a lot. I mean, we, we pretty figured out that on a 15-minute test, if I'm like at that Lakehurst, New Jersey, and I've got my field measurement system out there collecting its log files, and I'm using seven TEMS phones out there, I'm generating about 10 gigabits of data in 15 minutes across all those file sets, okay? So I gotta, now I've got to be able to manage that data, and I've got to be able to figure out, I have specific statistics that I care about. I've got to be able to extract that stuff and report it to our customer and to the modeling guys 
as quickly as 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 efficiently as possible. So what we have to do is we've we've got a we've developed a, we're developing right now. This is work that's in progress. A data reporting capability, and it's kind of as you can see there's. Here's the three pieces of equipment. They generate file types. We're going to store the, the raw data files. We're actually going to apply a, a parser and report generator that we're developing now, which would be applied to the files to extract the data and report the statistics in a usable format for our customer community, okay? And so that's what this is kind of depicting right here in this picture on the left. So we've grouped the data by five different characteristics. Uplink grants, and that's the, you know, the grant, the, the PRB allocations that are provided on a per millisecond basis to each UE. Then the resultant UE transmit power from those grants, we talked about that a little bit already. The scheduler performance, remember what I said, there is no 3GPP requirement on schedulers and there, we have no knowledge of the schedulers when we're doing these passive monitoring. So we have to infer from the data we collect, but we care about how that scheduler operates because that might have the biggest impact on how PRVs are allocated, how UEs are managed from, a, from millis, subframe to subframe, depending on load, et cetera. Right, we've talked about all that stuff. Also, it's like, from certain types of data, you can determine what the sector morphology is, you know, because this, so we want to be, there are certain characteristics that we can get from about that. And then what, what's the UE distribution? Remember, remember I told you that the wave judge can collect all the UEs that it can see that that sector is engaging with the downlink from, right? I have no idea where those UEs are, but from this data, I can pretty much determine what's going on. There, when if, and a lot of people will go, well, why don't you just get the GPS information that's coming off the phones? Okay, so that's not communicated on the RF link. There's a lot of location services stuff going on, but what that, what's going on there is that the multiple E-node Bs will send data back to the EPC, and that's how that's being calculated over there. It's not communicated over the wireless network, so we have to infer where the UEs are distributed, we have no knowledge of where they are, right? So, and how that affects all this, you know, the management that the, the how the E-node B controls that set of UEs. So those are five groupings. And so what I've got down here on the bottom of this slide is an example. This is just one section. This is, these are, here's a set of, why, what do we want out of this, okay? How many, how many, um, Resource blocks are assigned versus time on a subframe basis. That's one question we have. Another one is, what is the distribution of all possible uplink grant resource block sizes? You know, that, that scheduler impacts that, the, the, the RF environment affects that, and, and the you know, B has to react in one millisecond and make those decisions so that it can control all the UEs, so the UEs can transmit four subframes later, right? Where are RVs assigned within an uplink channel versus time on a, on a per subframe basis? What is the distribution of RV start location? Where in the channel does it tell if, it, if, it only, if it's only controlling three UEs at a time, for example? Does it use the center of the channel? Or does it, and I would, I would imagine sector to sector that's going to change because of things like frequency selective fading and stuff like that, right? But we'll be able to see all this stuff. I'm just giving you some examples. So you see there's a list of questions for this characteristic, uplink grant, then it's like, okay, what are the statistics associated with that question that I need to have in my output report from my data, from, from this data management process that I described, right? And so these are the specific, you know, like, so we want to get the number of RVs versus subframe, and that would be like a scatter plot. Uh, a, a probability distribution function of the number of RVs per grant. But I could do it by collection, by morphology, time of day. I could do all the data. I could do it for a specific rentee. That's rentee is a temporary ID for an up for a UE, right? And then, and I, I have all this information, so I can go and I can get all these statistics, and I'm going to get a lot of it. It's going to be this is a big data problem. Okay, we figured if we, it's, it's not it's big, but it's not that bad. Because if we did 100 different measurements, and I told you it's about 10 gigabits each, okay, that's a terabyte. I can store that on something that costs less than 100 bucks these days, so it's not too bad for the problem. Anyway, um, PR, PRB allocation versus subframe index. Now, there's a subframe index of the, for, during the day. Each subframe has a very specific number. We'll know all that because we'll have all that information. So 
So I'll be able to see what's happening versus time, right? Um, probability distribution, distribution function of Grant start. You know, where, where does it start? And, and what's happening statistically there? How many concurrent users each subframe? That was something that I talked about a minute ago. Um, probability distribution function of push RV occupancy. And what that is, is that's a combination of start and the RV start and RV count, right? It's a combination of both. Okay, so then, now where do I get that information? And these are the, this is in the, from the LTE channel. Downlink control channel DCI zero <coughs> format zero is a big target for us. And then the SIBs. Now SIBs are static information about that sector. It, that it never changes. Things like alpha, P0, the, 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 the PCI, the, the specific cell identifier, um, the channel bandwidth, there's a number of different things. And so you can see then from each, from each of those different chunks of the control channel information, these are the target parameters that I need in order to get this statistic, right? And I can get, and these are things that I, can, that I know I can get. Now, I can get them from the San Jose Wave Judge, or I can get them from the Thames phone, depending on what I'm doing with my testing. And I may want to look at a combination of both so I can see correlation. And so we can do that too. Okay, does that make sense? So that's what we're doing. And we do the same process for every one of these characteristics. We have a total right now. This is still work in progress. We're discussing it with the modeling team and getting the inputs from them because that matters because we care but I, you don't want to design this in a vacuum I and mean, why am I doing this you know I was like it's a lot of work and it's interesting and I like it but it's like why am I doing it and I've got to make sure that I get the inputs from all the customer community and the other parts of the technical team that I'm working with in the modeling to make sure that I got the right statistics and I'm answering the right questions okay to be able to understand the resultant UE emissions that are that happen in from sector to sector to sector, so we can do the, the ultimate job. So that makes sense. Right now we have like 25 of these. That's a sample. I think that's six right there. We have 25 total spread over those five. Okay. Now, in order to do that, in order to do that, you have to have a data model. I'm not going to get into the details of this because this is work in progress, also. But basically, we discussed the different pieces of equipment in the system. You know, so I've got this data model, I do a test. And I'm going to do a test and I'm going to have TEMS data, I'm going to have wave judge data, I'm going to have RFI spectrum data, and I'm also going to have metadata. Now this is stuff that the, you, that the, that the, test, the field test engineer would enter. Time of day. Is it raining or not? Amazingly, that might matter. Excuse me. Um, date, uh, a, a location by address, and maybe even submit a picture of where we're at. Uh, and also the, the uh, specific GPS location of the receiver, the, the, the GPS location of the sector antenna, because we'll have done the sector survey prior to that using the Tensong, we'll know where that antenna is, okay? That's what this is. Now, and that's kind of, you can see, it's the list of some of those examples and stuff here, and this is the relationship of some specific parts of that, because it's a layered thing, right? And I'll use the wave judge as an example here. So the wave judge captures things on, on a frame for frame basis. And then there's a whole list of cell parameters within that. Um, and then so then that frame is broken up into subframes, obviously max of 10, we all know that, right? And then frame start and frame end is known in terms of a start, because I got GPS time, I got universal time applied to all this information, right? And within that subframe, there's, there, there, there's a number assigned to each. And there's a there's a and then the frame is associated with it. Now it's like how many UEs am I actually controlling within that? And that information that's the rentes. We care about the C rentes the most. Those are the ones that are established from an RRC an active RRC connection. Okay, and then the list of messages from that. Okay, so in the rentes I get an ID number for the phones that are being controlled, and then I get a message list from that. Okay, that message list. That's when you start getting into a lot of these data that's going to feed my statistic. So you kind of see that we're like starting from the top and we got to understand all this stuff because we've got to know where to go get this information for the report generator in order to efficiently apply it to the, to the file and, and spit it out. I'm just about out of time, but I think I'm just about done. So that's what we're doing right now. And here's some examples. This is some example statistics. This is not, some of this is real data, some is not, but it's fairly, it's fairly limited. Number of resources per subframe. So this is a, a probability distribution function of that. 
probability distribution function of concurrent users per subframe basis. Um, number of resources per uplink grant. This is real data too, and it's kind of interesting that you, it's typically down in the four to five number. And, and it's funny because in some sectors we've seen it's, in, it's on specific numbers basing on how the bands are subdivided in the schedulers and stuff. And we see even numbers, they tend to like a lot. Now in this case, it seems to be odd, but they, might, they, can, they can adjust that sector for sector, right? Now, transmit power, distribution, you know, probability distributions, PDS and CDS of the shared channel and the control channel, we can get that from the ten. We can get the control channel from the ten stone. We can't get that from the wave judge. And then power headroom, that's a report from the UE. And this is a very powerful parameter for us because we care about transmit power for a whole bunch of UEs that we have no knowledge of where they are and no control and, and no specific, we don't know the users, right? So we can't get any data directly from them. So we have to infer. But, the, in, the, in, the, in the shared channel, there's a thing called the power headroom report from the UE. The E node B tells it how often to provide that report, but from that report, you can directly correlate that with shared channel transmit power, and that's very powerful, and that's for us. That's what we care about that, okay? Okay, so in summary, we're in the phase one. We're modeling at phase one right now. Um, the, the LT modeling and simulation team keeps going. There's a significant focus on scheduler impacts. They're starting to look at the mix of indoor and outdoor users because that will the propagation environment for an indoor user is a lot different than an outdoor user, right? I mean, there's 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 building walls to go through and stuff like that. So it's going to be a, even though the distances and the delay is the, is is the same as like if I'm standing here and there's a guy right outside that window and we're both on the phone with the same sector. He's probably got about a 15 dB less propagation environment, but his delay is the same, basically, from at, you know within within a symbol of the of the of the LTE network. So, how does that impact how the scheduler operates? That's kind of an example of why that matters. Okay, and then the measurement and test effort. So the thing that's interesting, that's nice, is that the modeling guys are doing are doing work and defining parameters that they need, which helps inform us of what we need to collect. And now we're going to go off and collect data and provide specific characteristics and statistics back to the modeling guys so that they can do their job and we can make sure that everything is, 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 is more, is real, the modeling is realistic and based on real world uh, what's really happening. Okay, so I apologize I got a little bit long winded but, and we're out of time, but I am, I'm done. So is there any other questions? I appreciate your attention.